Okay. Uh, um, I want to preface my uh, program here by just commenting that the uh, uh, material you're going to see basically is in the format of uh, what the American Philatelic Society uh, judging manual requires for first day cover exhibits of a single stamp. Um, in addition to caches, they'd like to hear some philatelic information. So if the stamp that you're showing first day covers of has uh, uh, die proofs, essays, uh, marginal markings like plate numbers and so on, talk about those uh, in the exhibit and, and demonstrate them as well as first day covers. And then there's also a section towards the end you show usage of the stamp. Uh, what was it intended to be used for? Do you have uh, some examples of registered mail usage and air mail usage and so on? So we're gonna have um, achieve all these in the process of, uh, of the program. Uh, there are actually four stamps with this design. Uh, the 1933 perforated issue that is the focus of this program and the 1934 Imperf Pain of Six was issued at the 1934 National Philatelic Exhibition in New York. And then you have the two 1935 Farleys, both the Perf and the Imperf. Stamp designers of the Bureau of Engraving and Printing uh, submitted four horizontal format designs, none of which President Roosevelt approved. One of the designers, Victor S. McCloskey Jr., submitted two more designs based on sketches by FDR. Since the stamps were to be used to raise funds for Admiral Byrd's second Antarctic expedition, they were assigned a 25 cents denomination. The design on the right was accepted with a change to three cents to meet the current first class rate. And the funds would come from a fee of 50 cents to be charged for a cover to be mailed to subscribers from the Little America Post Office in Antarctica. Next, we have a large diet proof. Some uh, marginal inscriptions uh, by uh, autographs of the uh, designer, Victor McCloskey, and the uh, vignette engraver, his name was uh, J.C. Benzing. The other thing you want to look for are anomalies uh, and errors in the process of printing the production of the stamp. Uh, these are some pre-printing paper creases, some pretty obvious ones at that. Then you have misperforations, if you can find them. The first vertical row of stamps in the upper right pane of plate number 21167 contains transfer roll defects, a spur on the back of the E in the word sense, and a spot on top of the first I in the word expedition. Plate numbers 21167, 68, 69, and 70 were all used for this uh, perforated stamp. In September 1933, the Post Office Department released this announcement of the stamps issuance and describing how collectors could send in 53 cents and a pre-addressed envelope that would receive the new stamp and be canceled at the temporary post office in Little America during uh, Bird's expedition there. Three cents would pay for the covers returned by first class mail and the 50 cents would go towards fundraising for the supplies for the expedition. The stamp was issued October 9th, 1933. This October 4 cover is the earliest known use. So it's a pre-date, whether accidental or intentional, I guess we will never know. This is a one day pre-date canceled on October 8th at the New York Times Square station. This is a registered first day cover with three cents for the letter rate and 15 cents for the registry fee. So it takes all six of the stamps. And the way you can tell it's a first day is you look on the back uh, and then of course it's uh, dated October 9th 
which is when the, this uh, cover was mailed. And then uh, there's a Chicago, Illinois registration and a, uh, another one on October the 11th, which is probably the uh, date that it was delivered. An airmail uh, special delivery. The air rate for the first ounce was eight cents. The second ounce was 13 cents. And then you had 10 cents for the special delivery fee. So uh, this is actually a convenience payment of 31 cents using 11 of the stamps. Uh, thus it's two cents overpaid. This is a free Frank envelope of Senator Harry F. Byrd, which was uh, Richard Byrd's brother. Uh, and he ha has a uh, unofficial ship cancel. The USS Cormorant was in port at Washington at the time that the stamp was issued. So Senator Byrd placed a piece of stamp salvage at the left and made a notation on either side of the stamp to indicate it came from plate number 21168. I don't know why he had to do that. It doesn't make any difference. Looking at some caches, John Gill was a printer by trade and designed caches for first day and naval covers. Edward Hacker's father was a printer and got Ed interested in first day covers. Ed created caches until the late 1930s when his father left the printing business and Ed became a home builder. He surfaced again in the 1960s and prepared Civil War Centennial covers and operated under the name of Centennial Covers. He also made caches for space events. Copies of the Edward Hacker cache were reduced in size and lacking some of the text above the image of Bird and appear in two different colors. These covers were prepared by Henry Hamelman, a well-known FTC servicer at the time and recognized by his distinctive handwriting. He addressed them to Max Korn because they both worked for the post office department. Korn himself was not a cache maker. The Beverly Hills Philatelic Society under the leadership of its president, Robert J. Camel, was a chapter of the APS and prepared caches for first day covers. The one for the bird issue was designed by Captain Donald C. Coltrane. The cache covers were marked on the back with a serial number. Hundreds were printed, but this is number one. One of the scarcer first day covers by Albert Ressler. He became a dealer at age 19 and began servicing first day covers in 1924. Ressler was a dealer, a cover servicer, and a cache maker from the 1920s into the 1940s. His covers documented first days as well as many flight, naval, and other special events that might not otherwise have been recorded. Frederick Rogers Rice worked for the Veterans Administration in Washington and it was a dealer and a cachet maker and served as past president of the Collectors Club of Washington. He published a newsletter, which he sometimes used as a stuffer in his covers. Robert Bezell was a former bank teller and then became a draftsman. His hobby was photography. He prepared only 10 to 15 copies of his covers using photographic paper, so they are quite scarce. He would print the photo cache on the paper and fold it into the shape of an envelope as in the top cover, or simply cut and paste the photos as in the lower two covers. But they're all first day covers. He actually more, more designs than just these three, He's probably about eight or nine of them. Harry Ayor was a chiropractor and a part-time cover dealer residing in Indianapolis. He began servicing covers in the early 1920s. Varieties of this cache are known without the ship vignette and also without the airmail border. This is a unique combination of 
two caches. The printed cache at the left is by Hobby Cover Service that was operated from 1932 to 1938 by J. Henry Wilkins in Richmond Hill, Queens, New York. Cache maker Ralph Dyer then added his own hand-painted scene of a plane over Antarctic mountains and signed the cover, which was part of his personal collection. Dyer studied art and design at Cooper Union in New York and became a commercial artist and linotype operator. A general purpose rubber stamp cache of Charles Nichols. He was a Washington DC stamp and cover dealer. And although he serviced first day and airmail covers, he had little interest in caches. Nichols caught pneumonia and died in 1930 at age 38. His wife, Madeline, continued the business for several more years. His advertising stuffer was found in this cover. Postmaster General James Farley prepared many first aid covers with his stationery and sent them to friends. The upper court left corner is embossed the Postmaster General, Washington, official business. This one is addressed to George Le Petulier. He was president of the Long Island Railroad. The letter inside the first aid cover is on embossed post office department letterhead and explains the purpose of the new stamp. Farley signed it with his typical green ink. Give you a few seconds there to glance over the letter. Paul Seipel, oh, let me go back up, I missed. A Washington area collector, Philip Sims, and you can see his address embossed on the back of the uh, envelope. Uh, he used this hotel envelope to prepare a first day cover sent to a friend in Samoa. Warren was the first recipient in 1947 of the Washington Philatelic Society's DeVos Trophy for outstanding service to the hobby. No relation to the author, I assure you. But uh, in the field of first day cover collecting, looking for unusual destinations uh, is part of the game, part of the challenge. Now, Paul Seipel represented the Boy Scouts of America on Byrd's first Antarctic expedition in 1928. He then obtained a degree and served as a scientist on the second expedition. Seipel later coined the term wind chill factor. Caché by Henry Grimsland, a Chicago stamp and cover dealer. He was also a self-employed commercial engraver and this caché of his is engraved. It's autographed by Bird. Bird was besieged by collectors to sign covers. So he charged $10 to do so. If people sent him a cover and asked him to, asked him to sign it and didn't have the $10 enclosed, he sent it back to them and said, this is gonna cost you $10. Autographed by five significant people. William M. Mooney was the Washington DC postmaster. Robert E. Fellers was the superintendent of the stamps division of the post office department. William B. Wells was the engraver of the lettering and the stamp. Joachim C. Benzing was the engraver of the vignette. And of course, Victor McCloskey Jr. was the stamp designer. Now, just to be thorough, you like to include oddball things like a meter stamp first day cover. There's no need to use the stamp, but uh, it's grossly overpaid, but it's nice to have. This is an unofficial first day cancel at the uh, in New York and it's uh, addressed to the dealer, stamp dealer, Herman Tell Asperg. Another unofficial cancel, this is a New York and Washington Railway Post Office on an Albert Gorham cache. 
Gorham was a lawyer for the Navy Department and a part-time dealer and cache maker. Now let's take a look at uh, non-first day uses of the stamp. This four page promotional brochure of the Bird Antarctic Expedition, the second expedition, describes how to prepare covers with stamps for servicing at the Little America Post Office and the hand of machine cancels that would be available there. The first cancellation was January, 1934. However, due to logistics problems, not all of the canceled mail made it onto the ship that came back in the spring of that year. Some of the mail, such as this piece, received a cachet at the lower left, explaining that the, what the delay was uh, all about, and it was returned the following spring in 1935 with a back stamp at San Francisco, where the mail entered the United States, and then from there it went to the final destination. This is the post office department notice that some of the 1934 first cancellation mail would be held and returned the following year. This is the post office department notice that some of the 1934 first cancellation mail would be held. Uh, oh wait, I did that already, sorry. Uh, this is the POD notice of the cutoff date to submit covers for the 1935 or second cancellation. Address covers and 53 cents per cover had to be sent to Washington by November 1st, 1934, in order to receive the second year of cancellation. This is second cancellation mail of January 1935 with a penguin cachet denoting that it is second year mail. It's signed by Charles Anderson, who was the postmaster of Little America Post Office. This is just a special envelope used on the supply ship for the second Bird Antarctic Expedition, the SS Jacob Rupert, that has an unusual embossed cache crest. In addition to destinations, I like to look for uses of the stamp uh, with unusual origins. So here's one that was sent from Guam to Hawaii. This uh, cover was sent in 1938 from the American consulate in Beirut, Syria. Lebanon was still part of greater Syria at that time. And it was posted on board an American export lines vessel that called at the port of Beirut. Turning to uh, destinations, uh, since 1899, mail to Puerto Rico is handled as domestic mail. The surface rate of Venezuela was three cents under the Pan American Convention. It did not increase to five cents until the UPU rate went into effect in 1953. Usage to the Philippines. This was mailed November 20th, 1933 from New York and sent to Persia with a Tehran arrival of December 19th. The surface rate of five cents was conveniently made just using a pair of the bird stamps. So it's one cent overpaid. Now this was mailed from Little America with the 1934 first cancellation and sent to Canton, China. Uh, this was a usage on the philatelic agency of the post office department to fill an order for the bird stamps. A return stamp was used on the penalty envelope because the buyer had to pay return postage. 
And inside that envelope was this copy of the invoice. Uh, the stamps were not intended for use at Little America because he didn't enclose 50 cents. He actually bought 10 copies of the stamp. And so he sent 30 cents and uh, one was used on the uh, envelope to get them back to the purchaser. And the other nine were enclosed with this uh, invoice. This uh, stamp was used for many different types of events. Uh, this is for the launching of the submarine, the USS Porpoise, at Portsmouth, New Hampshire on June 30th, 1935. The United States Navy airship, the USS Shenandoah, flew in a violent thunderstorm over Ohio and broke into three pieces on September 3rd, 1925. The stern portion it landed near Ava, Ohio. 29 of the 43 crew members miraculously survived. This cached cover was prepared for the 10th anniversary of the crash, and the design incorporates a piece of fabric originally taken from the crash site. This is usage on a banquet menu from the Chicago Philatelic Society in 1934. The imperf paint of six stamps was issued February 10th, 1934 at the National Philatelic Exhibition in New York, as I mentioned before. This unique hand-painted first day cover by Ralph Dyer is signed not only by him, but also Bernd Balchen, the chief pilot on Byrd's first Antarctic expedition, and Harold June, the chief pilot on the second expedition. But this imperf issue is another story. End of program. Well, thank you, Alan. You're very welcome. I, I see. I always wonder where, where people get this stuff. It's ah. just amazing. I guess many many of years luck. of searching. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Has eBay made it? You know, an online mate getting uh, this kind of extra stamp postal ephemera any easier? Uh, yes, it has. Uh, mm -hmm. I think a lot more people are, are able to expose the material and sell it and make it available. So uh, yeah, eBay is a godsend for uh, most collectors. Okay, good. Folks, anybody have questions? Yes, Alan, that was fantastic. Mike Bach from Reading. Yes. Uh, what made you choose this stamp? Um, I was uh, collecting U.S. and uh, finally decided I can't afford a lot of the ones that I had missing in my Scott National album. So um, I said, is there something I would like to uh, focus on? And I was sort of uh, interested in astronomy as a kid. So uh, I was interested in exploration and uh, I've always been fascinated by polar exploration. In fact, uh, collecting this stamp and then deciding to do a first day cover exhibit of it got me interested in what is known as polar philately. So I, of course I had to join the American Society of Polar Philatelists. And before I knew it, I was secretary and editor of their bulletin. So <laughs> one thing leads to another. But I've always been fascinated by the sign. It's a beautiful uh, uh, color and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's just a great stamp. Yeah. Can you show us uh, number 42 again, your for slide 42? Sure. I had a couple of questions. Okay, that came from a counselor service. Now, is that normally uh, postage free as from a counselor and they put this on to be able to use a stamp or do you know the story behind I, this? I'm not sure of the story. Yeah. Okay. I don't know if Tony W knows not, or not. No, I don't. Uh, his question's a good one and I don't know the answer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and maybe Alan, like a pack, might maybe like a packet boat where you had a put st uh, stamp of the uh, uh, country that was uh, that owned the ship. Mm -hmm. There were, we have we have a couple uh, FDR enthusiasts in the club, and was FDR and Richard E. Bird they were they were friends, or 
uh, I don't know uh, what the interaction between uh, Bird and uh, and FDR, uh, the extent of it. Okay. Okay. Because so I know in the um, FDR book is a sketch of the stamp very much, you know, like it shows now where he drew the uh, the globe and the and the and the different, uh, you know, right journeys and things like that. So, and he, he drew several of the others as well. And when I was in the Navy, there was, I think the Richard E. Bird, who was a destroyer stationed up in the Boston area. And we used to get their patients oh, yeah. and we'd have to log them in the book, the Richard E. Bird. And I remember we sort of like, who is this Richard E. Bird? I never did figure it out until I became a stamp collector, but it is a beautiful stamp. I love the color. I love the design. And some of these um, covers that you have with the multiple issues are just beautiful. Yeah. Alan, Bob, Bob has his hand up. Oh, go ahead, Tony, and then we'll go to Bob. Go ahead, Tony. Please, Tony, go ahead. I think you were going to answer. Alan, it, it's really a tour de force what you have here. I, I'm just incredibly impressed. What was one thing I noticed was it seems like the machine cancel from Washington, D.C. Uh, was incomplete and typically was incomplete, uh, I mean, which is, of course, not your fault. Yeah. It, it seems to be part of the process. Yeah. Maybe they were, uh, maybe the volume was so high, they just uh, kind of threw them through the machine and uh, it didn't make a clear impression. I don't know. So, Bob, you know, I think that, you had really your hand minor. Up. And yeah, Bob had a hand up. And then we have a question in the chat as well. Where were the two spur locations? And then Bob, if you have a question, we can maybe get Alan to answer that too. Yeah, I, my question is, uh, there are two souvenir sheets for uh, the bird uh, expedition listed in Scott's 735 and 768. Right. But there's no, if my, my uh, Scott specialized catalog is 2019, there's no information there how you distinguish between the two. Uh, by the way, great presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. But oh, you're <laughs> welcome. Um, yeah, in order to uh, the Farleys, in order to know that they are the Farleys for sure, you need uh, uh, multiples, you know, uh, more than just the pain by itself. The pain by itself, you really can't tell. Uh, and with the sheet stamp, you can tell the perf uh, and the from 1933 and the 1935 40 perp uh, because of lines that are uh, uh, in, the, in the center and on the edge of the sheet. But uh, with the imperf uh, sheet, you really don't know. So just individual sheets, you just can't tell. You need, you need multiples of the uh, miniature sheets. Is that correct? Yeah. Because yeah. I think for the, uh, the 1934 sheets, they were all severed. But uh, the Farleys, there are, they are known uh, in several uh, copies of the souvenir sheet and a given pane, they're still connected. Okay, many thanks. You're welcome. I, I, I wish Scott would uh, note that. Yeah. Because <laughs> the, 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 the CAD values are quite different and uh, it, it's, with singles, you just can't tell. That's right. Sounds like a letter to the editor. I'm just saying. Any other questions, please? Alan, I have a question, if you can hear me. I know yeah. it looks Go like my, my, my internet's a little unstable, but for all the caches by now, after all the years of studying this, I, I presume there's a checklist and all of the caches or most of them are known. And if someone were to collect this, they kind of already, or is there still some unknown cachet that's out there that is still yet to be found that you're looking for or uh, there are some that are un yeah. there are unknown we don't know who the designer was but the malone planty catalog uh is the best source uh it's sort of dated now because it's been quite a few years since it was issued uh really ought to be updated um but that's your best source for finding caches of any uh u.s stamp say between uh the early 20s up through 1939. Then there were Malone Planty cache, cache catalogs also for the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, but that's the best source to go to. But then uh, every once in a while, one shows up that's not in the catalog. So you can say, well, it's unlisted. 
Uh, mm -hmm. That's uh, the best way to market. So that the judges are impressed about the challenge factor. You have a uh, unlisted on there on the page. Absolutely. Thank you. No, thank you, Alan. Yeah, we're always looking for the unlisted. That's what keeps us. That's what that's keeps right. us searching, right? We want to find that that first of its kind. So yeah, yeah. Thank you, Alan. What is the state of first day cover collecting? Is it still, going uh, still it's still thriving. Uh, yeah. Now the first day cover society is. Uh, uh, has had some decline in membership, uh, which all uh, yeah. the societies have done. Yeah, at one time, I recall the First Day Cover Society was over 2,000 members. They're down closer to like 1,300, 1,200, somewhere in that uh, category now. They're still number three, I think, APS and then ATA are ahead of them membership-wise and then, uh, then the First Day Cover Society. Mm-hmm. But the uh, it's still very active. Uh, the journal comes out, uh, uh, you know, six times a year, and uh, we have a new editor now, uh, Martin Kent Miller, who's doing a, quite a number of journals, specialty journals now. Yeah, let's tip our hat to uh, to Martin. I would agree with you, Alan. He's doing a phenomenal job. We know he's yeah. doing Pennsylvania Postal History one as well, and just continuing yeah. to elevate that. Any other questions for for Alan, please? Uh, what were the ones that were in the chat box? Was there a question or two? Yeah, um, I, I think that came from Dennis, if I'm reading it. Where were the two spur locations? Can you please go back to the slide with the spurs? That would be great. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Okay. Aha, there we go. Actually, uh, all the stamps in that first uh, uh, left-hand uh, row uh, have these uh, roll, transfer roll deflect, defects. Has that been plated specifically to which pane and sheet and row and column? I mean, has that been? Yeah, done it's only not? it's only one um, plate number that has this uh, these transfer roll defects. That has that. Okay. And yeah, so plate the number E two, and one, the one, I six, are seven. both found on the same plate? Oh, there you go. Okay, got it. Yeah. Because I know Dennis is going to be searching. Yeah, it was the first vertical row. I used to have a strip of about nine in the exhibit, but, uh, you know, three is just as just as good. It was that whole vertical row on, the, uh, on that pane uh, from that plate that uh, these uh, spur, uh, spurs occur. Well, I don't think, Alan, you've shown something that many folks I don't think we're aware of. So everyone's going to go and check out their, their stamps to find the burr and the little dot over the eye. You were yeah. looking for this is real fly specking 101, which is great. You can identify it. Sure. If, if you go back and look older issues of the uh, Bureau of Issue Specialist, which is now the U.S. Stamp Specialist, you'll find a lot more little yes. tiny plate flaws on this issue. They're just, just too numerous. But these are uh, kind of significant and they're repeated, you know, on the, on the same pane. So that's why I have an example of them. Thanks for sharing. Very nice.